All right. Well, Shabbat Shalom. Today we're going to go scuba diving. We're not just going to ride the water of the word. We're going to go snorkeling, scuba diving, looking at some awesome coral reefs of the word of God. Uh, one of the things I uh, want to bring up, last week the Torah portion was Balak, right? Okay, who, can anybody tell me the top word in English? Balaam, that's correct. You have like uh, B-L-A-M, Balaam. Okay, now what's the bottom word? Amalek, the A-M-L-K. Okay, so you have Balaam and Amalek. How many of you know Balaam was a type of Amalek? Did you know that? Do you want me to prove it for you? <laughs> Divide the word in half. You can take Balaam and Amalek's name, and it forms Balaam with those two, and the other two form Amalek. There are two names going across. You'll see also is going down. Balaam and Amalek are tied together. Isn't that amazing? So here you can take Balaam and Amalek and see they are definitely related. Now, this Torah portion today is what? And who can read that? Phineas. We say Phineas in English, but it's actually Pincus. Pincus, that's exactly right. We're going to uh, talk about Pincus here, but let's begin with Numbers 25, verse 6 and 7. That's uh, just before this Torah portion begins. This is last week. Oh, let me ask you this first. What was Moses' father-in-law's name? Jethro. Jethro. Are you sure? <laughs> now you're wondering. Okay, we're going to take a look at Moses' father-in-law name in just a minute. Okay, but let's go back here. Behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought to his brethren a Midianite woman. Right there in the sight of Moses, he's flaunting it in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel. And what were they doing? They were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation because it was a horrible time at that time. And then look what happens. Arises Phineas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest. This is Aaron's grandson. And he saw what was happening. So he rose up from among the congregation and he took a javelin in his hand. And what did he do? He pierced him, shish kebobbed him. Okay. Now, it says here Phineas is in one sense was just a regular guy. He was just an anonymous member, but he rose up from among the congregation. This nameless person, because of what he does, all of a sudden becomes well-known. And he's about to commit a double homicide. <laughs> what is going on here? And not only that, he did a double homicide against a politician, for heaven's sake. Zimri was one of the chief princes of uh, the tribe of Simeon. Okay, now. Here, Zimri, right in front of Moses, takes this Midianite woman. You know what's bad about that, other than the fact of what they were doing? Moses' wife was a Midianite. Wow, it's like, hey, you married a Midianite. Okay, look at this, though. Here we're going to see Exodus 2, 6 and 17, 16 and 17. Now, the priest of Midian. Now, I want you to know that word priest is English. In Hebrew, it could be president. It doesn't have to be priest. He, it also could be a priest who's also the head. And it said he had how many daughters? Seven daughters. They came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and saved them and watered their flock. Okay, so Moses' name, you said, was? Jethro. Well, let's take a look here. Exodus 2, the very next verse, 18. When they came home to their father, Ruel, what? He said, how is it that you have come so soon today? Ruel wasn't his name really either. 
Rel means friend of God. It was more of a title, like prince or priest. He was a friend of God. Now look at Judges 4.11. Now Heber, the Kenite, which was of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses. Wait a minute. I thought his name was <laughs> Ruel. Now it's Hobab. Well, guess what? Hobab means embracer. Maybe he was a big hugger or something. <laughs> so here we see Moses' father-in-law's name is Ruel. It's Hobab. Okay. And now look at Exodus 3.1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. Well, Jethro means his excellency. It's another title. This guy has got several names, okay, or different titles. Uh, in case you didn't know that, I just wanted you to realize. So let's go to Exodus 6.23. We see Aaron, uh, for a wife, took Elisheva, which we say Elizabeth now, and she's from, Aaron's from Levi, but Elisheva is from Judah, okay? Now, look at this. <coughs> the sister of Nachshon. Remember who Nachshon was? Nachshon was the first one to jump into the Red Sea and split it. When Moses, we were trying to run from the Egyptians, Moses holds out his rod to divide the sea. Nachshon was the first one to jump in, and that's when it split, Okay, and he became the prince of the tribe of Judah. Well, his sister, okay, is who Aaron married. And look at that. They had four kids, Nadab and Abihu, Eliezer and Itamar. Okay, are you ready for this? Exodus 25, 625. And Eliezer, okay, this is Aaron's son, took him one of the daughters of Putiel. That's another name of Jethro. Jethro has like four different names. And Putiel means the fatness of God. <laughs> well, the fat is the Lord's. <laughs> okay. And she bare him Phineas. Okay, so what is this telling us? Phineas, who just killed this Midianite lady, his mother's a Midianite. You see how things can get tangled. Well, here Phineas' mom is a Midianite. Moses' wife was a Midianite. So much for Jewishness on your mother's side. <laughs> okay. Exodus 24, 9 and 10. Look what happens. Then went up Moses, this is at Mount Sinai, and Aaron with Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders. Do you see Eliezer and Itamar were left behind? Only Nadab. The two oldest got to go up to Mount Sinai. And then what do we see? Let's go back to the Torah portion in Numbers 25, verse 8 and 9. Here Phineas, he goes after the man of Israel. His name was Zimri, and the lady was Cosby. Into the tent and thrust both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. And the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. And those that died in the plague were 24,000. Can you imagine 24,000? Now here, if you remember, where were Aaron and Moses and the most of the congregation? They were in front of the tabernacle weeping and praying. There's nothing wrong with weeping and praying and fasting, but it wasn't until someone took action that the plague stopped. Sometimes we've got to do something. Okay, there's nothing wrong with weeping and praying and fasting, but sometimes you're not going to see results until somebody does something. And that's very important. So instead of just standing there, we sometimes we need to move forward. We need to take action. So what was the result of his action? I mean, if it was up to the democracy, they'd have killed Phineas. <laughs> you know, but... Oh, Matter of fact, Laodicea, let me just throw this in. Remember the church of Laodicea, the sleeping church? Do you know what Laodicea, how it's translated in English? Democracy. Laodicea means let the people decide. Isn't that fascinating? One of the uh, other interesting things, I'll just throw this in as well. 
some of the Jewish sages uh, thousands of years ago said that the terminal generation will be like the face of a dog. What does that mean? They said, when you see someone walking a dog, the dog is the one who's always leading. The, the leader is behind. And we're not supposed to lead from behind. We're supposed to lead from the front. But in a democracy, the people are leading the leader. And that's exactly where we're at today. Just another thought. Okay, Numbers 25, 10 through 13. So the Lord spoke to Moses, and he's trying to clarify the situation here so Phineas doesn't get killed. It, and he said, Phineas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron the priest, he turned my wrath away from the children of Israel while he was zealous for my sake among them. Here's the big difference. Phineas wasn't zealous for his sake as if he was offended. His zealousness was for God's sake. That I consume not the children of Israel in my jealousy. Do you know the Hebrew word for zealous and jealous are the same Hebrew word? And then he says this. Wherefore, say, behold, I give to Phineas my covenant of peace. And he will have it along with his seed after him, even the covenant of what? An everlasting priesthood. How many of you know that's a long time? And why was he given this covenant? Because he was zealous for his God and made atonement for the children of Israel. Well, guess what? There are things you only see in the Hebrew that you don't see in the English concerning this verse. Here, if you'll notice, Phineas, his name, the letter U, is shrunk it was made big, and all of a sudden, it shrunk. Why in the world, in every Hebrew Torah scroll, is the letter Yud, which is the smallest letter, even shrunk smaller? This is not normal Hebrew. And the reason why, some of them say, is because the letter Yud is a hand. In Hebrew, it means hand, a yod. Well, guess what? Even the small thing this insignificant person did with his hands achieved great results for God. So don't think I'm too small or this is such a small thing I'm accomplishing. No, it's those small things that we do in zealousness for God that can make all the difference in the world. The other thing is there's another anomaly in this Hebrew text. How many of you know this word is shalom? Do you see that? The Shen Lamed Vav Mem. In, in, oh, we don't have our Torah scroll here. But in every Torah scroll, you will see the word Shalom has an anomaly. Guess what it is? The letter Vav is split. Do you see this right here? That's how it is written in every Torah scroll. Why do they say that that happened? Well, the letter Vav became a Yud and a Vav. Well, guess what? Again, the Yud is a hand. The Vav becomes the spear. So you have the hand and the spear that brought shalom or peace. But here's the other thing. Look at Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and what else? The Prince of what? Shalom. So here we have a hand and a nail, and we have the nailed hand of the Messiah is the one who brings the everlasting peace to all of us. Wow. You find this only in the Hebrew. You don't see it in the English. So Phineas is a type of Messiah who's been given a covenant of peace. The broken vav there is the brokenness of the Messiah who achieved our deliverance. Now, the vav in Hebrew is the number six. And we know man was created on the sixth day. So here, the letter vav represents man. And here we have a man who's been broken, bringing atonement to Israel in the covenant of peace to stop the plague of sin and death. All of that is tied right there in the Hebrew. You don't get a C in the English. So now let's look at 1 Chronicles 
24, verse 1 through 4. If you remember, Aaron was the high priest, and his sons became high priests also, right? They were all the priests, and one of them became a high priest. And it says, here are the divisions of the sons of Aaron. The sons of Aaron, if you remember, were Nadab and Abihu, Eli, Eitzer, and Itamar, right? But it says, and you can see on my little chart here, Nadab and Abihu, boom, they were killed on the grand opening ceremony of Moses' tabernacle for offering strange fire. So now the priest, and they had no children. So therefore, all the priests are going to come from Eli, Eitzer, and Itamar. And it says here, um, David is the one who's setting up these courses at this time. And it says this, therefore, Eliezer and Itamar executed the priest's office. David distributed them, both Zadok, who was of the son of Eliezer, and Ahimelech of the sons of Itamar, according to their offices in their service. There were more chief men found of the sons of Eliezer than of the sons of Itamar, and thus they were divided. And so you look at the little chart here, you're going to see Eliezer has 16 chief sons, and Itamar only had eight. But what you're going to find happens in the near future. Itamar gets disqualified, and only the sons of Eliezer are going to become priests. And look at this. In 1 Chronicles 6, 4 through 8, Eliezer, if you remember, is the one who begot Phinehas, who's given the everlasting priesthood. And look at this. If you keep reading the begots, you see after six more generations, Ahita begot Zadok. So Zadok, who's mentioned in Ezekiel, only his sons get to serve in the millennial temple, are the ones from Phinehas. Isn't that amazing? As a matter of fact, so here we see Eliezer begots Phineas, and through Phineas's line comes Zadok. Well, guess what? Ezra is a son of Phineas. When you're reading Ezra, Nehemiah, and the whole priesthood, Ezra is from that same line. Look at this in Ezra 7, verse 1 and 2. After these things in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, the son of Sariah, the son of Azariah, Hilkiah, the son of Shalom, the son of Zadok. So here we see this priestly line comes all the way through Phineas, the grandson, who ended up sparing the guy. Look at Ezra 7, 5. The son of Phineas, the son of the Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the chief priest. Now look at Ezekiel 44, verse 15 and 16. The priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, God says. This is talking about the millennial temple that hasn't arrived yet. That the sons of Zadok that kept the charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me, they will come near to me to minister to me, and they will stand before me to offer to me the fat and the blood, says the Lord God. They get to enter into my sanctuary. They will come near to my table to minister to me, and they will keep my charge. The other ones didn't get to. Okay, so I think it's fascinating that this is the line that the priesthood is coming through. Now, (coughs) how long did Phineas live? He was given an everlasting priesthood. But how long do you think he actually lived? Anybody have a wild guess? Drum roll. Come on. Well, let's do a little history. I love trivia. Okay, remember after Moses, Aaron, they wander for 40 years in the wilderness, and then comes Joshua in the time of the judges for like 400 years, right? Well, here's a little history. Othniel, who was Caleb's younger brother, it says in Judges 3.11 that he judged Israel for 40 years. And then it says they served Moab for 18 years. In Judges 3.12. And then came Ehud, and the land rested for 80 years. And then Shamgar. And then they served Canaan for 20 years. And then with Deborah, and the land rested for 40 years. Then they served Midian for 7 years. Gideon for 40 years. Tola for 23. Jer for 22. Then they served the Ammonites for 18 years. Then came Jetha for 6 years. Ibzan 7. Elon 10. Abdon 8. They served the Philistines for 40 years. And Samson ruled 20 years. And we're through Judges 16, 31. How, if you were to add that up, that's a long time. 
So now let's go to Judges chapter 20, which is after Judges 16, after Samson. It says in verse 27 and 28, And the children of Israel inquired of the Lord, for the ark of the covenant of God was there in those days, and so was Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, standing before it. He's about 400 years old, guys. We don't ever hear of him dying. Isn't that fascinating that when you see this, oh, my goodness. And they're asking him, shall I go out to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother? And shall I? How many of you ever saw that before? This guy has been around for a long time, and he was given an everlasting priesthood. I just thought that was kind of cool. Okay, going back now, it says he was zealous for God. How many of you know it's good to be zealous for God? But look at this. In Romans chapter 10, verse 2, God, Paul says, I bear them record that they do have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. We can have a zeal for God, but in our zealousness, we can take the Torah and beat people over the head. Or we can go about and be mean and cruel to people and we think we're doing God a favor. This is the difference between doing something for God in your own zealousness versus doing things according to God's zealousness and jealousness. Let me give you an example. Let's go to 2 Samuel 21, verse 1 and 2. It talks about there was famine during the time of David for three years. And every year, David would inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said, it's because of Saul and his bloody house, because he slew the Gibeonites. And so the king called the Gibeonites and said to them, now the Gibeonites were one of those people they were supposed to kill when they entered, but uh, they spared them, and so now they're having the consequence of that. Uh, they were not of the children of Israel, but were the remnant of the Amorites. And the children of Israel had sworn to them, and Saul had sought to slay them in his zeal. So Saul, in his zeal, sought to slay them, but see, it wasn't according to God. Look at 2 Samuel 10, 15 through 17. Look at Yehu. Remember Yehu. He's the one that drove the chariot furiously, it says. When Yehu was departed, he lighted on Yohanadab, the son of Rechab, coming to meet him, and he saluted him. And he said, is your heart right? Is my heart is right? And Yohanadab said, yes, it is. And he says, if it be, give me your hand. And he gave him his hand, and he took him up into the chariot. And he said, come with me and see what? My zeal for the Lord. So they made him ride in his chariot. When they came to Samaria, he slew all that remained unto Ahab in Samaria till he had destroyed him, according to the saying of the Lord, which he spoke to Elijah. So here, this guy, yeah, you. Okay, he has a zeal for God, right? Isn't that what it says? But not according to knowledge. Look at this next verse, 2 Kings 10, 28 through 31. Thus Yehu destroyed Baal out of Israel, howbeit from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, Yehu departed not from after them. <clears throat> so in other words, he still worshipped the golden calves that were in Bethel, that were in Dan, and the Lord said to Yehu, because you've done well in executing the part that was right in my eyes, and you've done to the house of Ahab according to all that was in my heart, your children of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. But look at this next sentence. But Yehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart. He departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. So here, we can have a zeal for God but at the same time, not walk in the laws of God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And look at the Crusades, for heaven's sake. In the, you know, the year 1000, when they're killing all the Jews and uh, everything going on, the, the church throughout 2,000 years has had a zeal for God, but it was not according to knowledge. That's the problem. We can think we're doing God a favor by destroying his enemies, but you can't do that. Now, here's the other thing I want to show you. There are different words that I want to point out to you. There's a Canaanite on the top and a Canaanite on the bottom. 
Now, just like the only difference on the left between the Canaanite on the top and the Canaanite on the bottom is the letter K or C in English. Just like cake, C and K both can have the K sign, right? Or sound. Well, here we go. That's English. But in the Hebrew, there is the kuf, which is here, and the kof, which is here. They both make the K sign or K sound, but they are different letters. The noon is the same, and then the last two letters on the top and bottom, the aleph and na'in, are basically silent. So the main difference is knowing how it's spelled. You got a Canaanite both times, but one means someone who is zealous, and one means someone who is humiliated. So now let's go to the Bible and see what the Bible says. In Genesis 12, 6, Abram passes through the land to the place of Shechem and to the place of Mori, and the Canaanite was then in the land. That Canaanite means those who are humiliated. Now, in Exodus 20, verse 5, it says, You shall not bow down to these other gods to serve them. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Okay. That is basically the top word. He's jealous. He's jealous, uh, zealous. All right. And so here's the thing. Phineas was acting out of love, not of anger. That's a big difference. Even though he killed them, he was acting out of love, not of anger. Anger will always destroy us. It really will. How many of you know when you get angry, you end up doing something that you didn't intend to do and you're trying to backtrack, but oftentimes it's too late and we thought we were being, you know, good. So the thing is this, Phineas was not acting out of hatred. He was not acting out of self-righteousness. He was not acting in the flesh. He was sanctifying the name of God. Now let's look at Mark 3, 16 through 18. A horrible translation in English. I don't know what it is in Russian or Spanish, but look at this, or South Korean for those watching. It says here, Simon, he surnamed Peter, and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, he surnamed Boanerges, which is the sons of thunder. And then there's Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas and James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, and Simon, the what? What? They weren't all Jews. He was a Canaanite, one of the apostles. Sorry, wrong English translation. Look at the very same verse in another translation. He appointed the 12 and he mentions of all, and it says at the very end, and Shimon the what? Yeah, he was a zealot. He wasn't a Canaanite. He was a Canaanite. You following me? Okay. Look at Mark 3.18, another translation. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, Jacob, the son of Halphi, Tadai, and Simon, the what? There it is. This is why your English translations are so many different versions. You got to make sure you got the right one. Now, I don't know, uh, someone who does uh, Russian or South Korean or Spanish, let me know what they're say. But I think it's fascinating how some English translations are horrible. Okay. So now, look at, let me see where I'm at. <laughs> okay, we got to hurry. 1 Kings 19, let's look at verse 7 through 14. It says, the angel of the Lord came a second time and touched him, and he said, arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. And so he arose, Elijah did, and he ate and drank and went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. Okay, who knows another name for Horeb? Mount Sinai. Okay, Moses is, or uh, Elijah is several hundred years after Moses, and here he is going back to the very place that Moses was. Now, there also was another mistranslation in English, and I put the correction in the notes. Then it says he went into a cave. It's not a correct translation. He didn't go into a cave. He went into the cave, the very cave Moses had gone into, when God covered him with his hand and he proclaimed his name. But if you just see a cave and not the cave, you don't realize he's at the very same spot Moses was. And he's looking for an answer. He wants to see the glory of God. 
And he spent the night there. And the word of the Lord comes to him. And he said, what in the world are you doing here, Elijah? <laughs> That's what God said. Why are you here? And he said, because I've been very what? Zealous for, this, for the Lord, for the sons of Israel who forsaken your covenant. They've thrown down your altars. They've slain your prophets with the sword. And I, I alone am left. And they seek to kill me. It sounds to me like his zealousness was not for God. It was for himself. So here you can see another form. And then the prophet Elijah, who actually was acting zealously, but not for God's sake, but for his own sake. And then he says, they've slain your prophets with the sword. And I, I alone am left. And they seek to take away my life. And he said, go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by in a great strong wind toward the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord wasn't in the wind. After the wind was an earthquake, but the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord wasn't in the fire. I mean, he's trying to relive Moses' experience. But God wasn't there in any of those. And so after that came a still, small voice. And it happened when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and he went out and he stood at the cave entrance and behold, a voice came to him and said, again, what in the world are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very zealous, which means zealously zealous for the Lord of hosts because the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, throw down your altar, slain your prophets with the sword and I, I alone am left and they seek to take my life away. Wow. This is, uh, now some people may argue if this is Mount Sinai or not, whether it's in Arabia or the Sinai Peninsula, but I don't care. Um, <laughs> so the, the point is, this is the very place that he went. And, oh my goodness, see in Exodus 33, 22 on your notes, it's when the glory of the Lord passed by in front of Moses. But you know what? Instead of hurling accusations against Israel... God was telling Elijah, why don't you plead for their cause? All too often, we want to slay the wicked rather than pray the wicked get saved. You following me? Elijah declares himself to be zealous for God. He has shown that God does not always disclose himself in dramatic ways. Sometimes it's the still small voice is how God moves. Um... It seems Elijah has a personal agenda, a mix of the flesh as well as the spirit. Uh, so he wasn't necessarily trying to sanctify God's name. Uh, if we're going to stop the plague that I believe is coming to America as well, we need to do it for the Lord's sake, not a self-righteousness sake. Look at Acts 21.20. When they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous for what? The Torah. That's what we want. <clears throat> Numbers 28, 1 and 2. We're going to jump to that verse. The Lord said to Moses, Command my people of Israel and say to them, My offering, my food, for my food offerings, my pleasing aroma, you shall be careful to offer it to me at its appointed time. Okay. Wow. Notice it's not Israel's. It's God's. He says, my offering, my food, my pleasing aroma. Now, I added some verses here at the last minute this morning. And you can just write them down and just listen as I read them. Numbers 28, it goes on to say in verse 6, it's a regular burnt offering, the one that was ordained at Mount Sinai for a pleasing aroma, a food offering to the Lord. Okay, so why did God say they're to be offered at its appointed time? One reason is to prevent us from drifting. How many of us know even the calendar we use now has drifted from the biblical calendar? That's the problem, it, which also affects the Jubilee. So here, the other thing is God ordained it at Mount Sinai. How many of you know 
If you do the same thing over and over, it can become a routine and you don't have any more zealousness in it. You know, get up and say my prayers. Okay, prayer, prayer. Okay, move on. I did my job. But it's nothing personal. How would you like your spouse to say something to you? Uh, pretty soon it's meaningless if it's the same thing and they don't even sound like they mean it. You know, I mean, oh, didn't I tell you I loved you 40 years ago? <laughs> or, yeah, I mean, just whatever. God wants us to have our heart in it. That's why he said, just like it was at Sinai, that first time is always great. First time I saw Mount Rainier, it was awesome. But after a while, you go by Mount Rainier, and it's the same old Mount Rainier. <laughs> but I tell you what, it's still awesome to me. It really is. It's just awe-inspiring. But it says it's supposed to be a pleasing aroma. Numbers 28, verse 8. The other lamb, he says, I want you to offer at twilight like the grain offering of the morning. And like its drink offering, you shall offer it as a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. How many of you love to smell outdoor barbecue sometimes? You know, yeah. Oh, I'm going to go to the neighbor's house. <laughs> Here's the problem. Look at Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. Add that to your notes. God is telling th the earth to listen. He says, here, O earth, behold, I'm bringing a disaster upon this people. It'll be the fruit of their own devices because they've not paid attention to my words. And as for my law, they have rejected it. Wow. What use to me is your frankincense that comes from Shiva or the sweet cane from a distant land? Your burnt offerings are not acceptable, nor your sacrifices are pleasing to me. I don't like this smell. It's no longer my offering. It's your offering. And you're just doing it. I mean, just like someone who abuses their spouse and then immediately comes and offers them flowers. What are you telling them to do with those flowers? You know, I mean, it's just like here, Israel is constantly treating God horribly and think as long as they go through the routine, he's going to be happy. God is a very personal being. being. God has feelings. So <coughs> we're going to end there. <coughs> but I have one more thing that I want to start doing. Number one, for those that were listening at the very beginning, I forgot to say the date for the blind people. <coughs> so this lesson <coughs> was July 23rd of 2022, and the tour portion was Phineas. Uh, the blind people want me to mention that for them because it helps. But here's the other thing I want to start doing. How many, I mean, we have so many nations that are watching live right now. I'll give you the count here in a little bit. But I want to start praying for a different nation every week. And if you're from one of the other nations and you want us to pray for you, email me, markbiltz at msn.com, <coughs> and we want to pray for your nation. If you remember, <coughs> Sarah couldn't get pregnant, Abraham's wife. When Abraham prayed for the other guy's wife to get pregnant, Sarah got pregnant. I really believe if we want to see blessings here, we need to quit thinking about ourselves and start praying blessings upon other nations. <coughs> so we're going to do a different one today. I want to talk about Cambodia. <coughs> I think Cambodia is a very important Nation, you can see it here. It's over there uh, by Vietnam, Thailand, Laos, you know, close to India. Let me tell you a little bit about Cambodia before we pray for them as well. <coughs> they are 93% Buddhist, 4% Muslim, 2% uh, Christian, and 1% other. So if you're a believer there, you're going to feel a little marginalized, all right? Well, guess what's happening there? <coughs> In anticipation of their upcoming election, this next 2022, 2023, their prime minister, Hun Sen, made use of a worsening COVID-19 pandemic to expand authoritarian control by further restricting civil and political rights and failing to protect the social and economic rights of the marginalized groups, his government adopted a new overbroad COVID-19 law allowing for up to 20-year prison sentence for violations of COVID-19 measures. <coughs> so let's stand. We'll close in prayer. And we'll pray for the Cambodians. And at the same time, 
uh, if you're from another nation and you're watching and you know of something going on in your nation, please let us know and we'll add you to our prayers. Avinu Mokenu, our Father King, we just thank you so much that you love us so much. You sent your only son to redeem this world. We need to repair this world. We broke it. We need to repair it. And Father, right now, we also want to lift up the people in Cambodia <coughs> and this political situation, religious situation that they're in right now. Give the believers uh, hope and victory. We pray for supernatural events for them. Father, too often here in the United States, we don't realize how other people have it uh, in authoritarian regimes. <coughs> so, Father, uh, even though we're going that way ourselves, Father, I just pray right now for those people in Cambodia that you would show them uh, your love, that you would draw the believers closer to you, that they would become a light to their nation. And we pray for the salvation of the Buddhists. We, we pray, Lord, that many people in Cambodia would be saved. There'd be a revival that would take place among their nation. And Father, right now, we also just want to thank you for all those from the other nations that are watching live right now. I want to thank you for all those here locally as well, for all those who are sowing seed into your kingdom to make your Torah honorable once again, that it would be magnified. I just thank you for all those who support this ministry, Father, to take, it's your ministry, it's not ours. We're just here to be a big light to all the nations of the world. And I just pray you continue to turn up the wattage of every individual watching live right now. Father, and those who are watching the live stream that's recorded, that they would be a uh, brighter light than ever before to all the people around them. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together, blessed are you, <coughs> Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit. Through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua, you alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. We'll have some worship, a 20-minute break worship, and then another teaching. Well, uh, let's start with uh, prayer. Avina Mokeno, our Father King, we just thank you so much that in spite of all the technical difficulties, we know you're still in control. And Father, right now we want to lift up all of our loved ones we know that have any uh, physical ailments. We still want to lift up those who are sick, uh, be it physically sick, emotionally sick, psychologically sick, whatever it may be. Father, even for those who may be spiritually sick and they're far from you, we just want to pray for our loved ones right now that they would uh, have someone that would encounter them that could speak your word in such a way as to bring them back into your fold. And Father, we also want, now want to pray for those who have any kind of financial needs. Maybe they need a car or a home or food on the table, whatever it may be. Father, we pray you would open the windows of heaven and find uh, surprising places where they'd be able to get the finances that they need. And Lord, we also want to lift up our nation and all those around the world, lift up your nation as well. We want to pray for all the political, military, religious leaders. Father, we know their hearts are in your hand, and we just pray that your will would be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And Lord, also we want to lift up at this time during the dire straits the nation of Israel, and we just pray for them right now that you also would turn the hearts of all of the Jewish people back to you and back to your Torah. We ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen, amen and amen. I had a, a feeling the devil was not going to like this teaching. <laughs> As you know, we finished the book of Corinthians, uh, and so I was going to start a new book, but it just so happens I don't want to start a new book and then have it interrupted because next week, I'm not going to be here because next weekend is my 45th wedding anniversary. <laughs> so uh, Vicki and I are going to disappear for a few days. Yes. But anyway, we're going to have Lance Hamill back. Uh, next weekend. Yay. So it's, it's still going to be good. Uh, be sure and come. But so anyway, so I, I wasn't going to start a new book today because of that, but I'm going to be starting the book of Ephesians. And Ephesians is mind-blowing as I've been researching it. So get geared up for that. You can be reading Ephesians in the next couple of weeks so uh, you feel a little more ready. 
And then, of course, those going with me to Turkey and Greece at the end of next month, we're going to be there in Ephesus, and that'll be a lot of fun. But because I want to come up with something else, <clears throat> what I've come up with is a lesson called just how close are we to the Lord's return? How many of you believe we're close? Yes. Yes. How many of you believe we're very close? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think he's not just at the door, but the door is opening. And I believe very soon the door is also going to be shut. Okay, so here we are. Some of this is going to be a refresher for some of you. It's going to be new for some of you. But I also have a bunch of other things I'm introducing but I really believe we are close. I believe we are that terminal generation. And uh, if you remember, if you look at this, uh, no, don't look at that. Ah! Uh, do we have our, my slides working, Jill? The PowerPoints? Oh, please, oh, please. Maybe they're not even in there. Is anybody in there? Earth to Nick. Uh, that's my PowerPoint slides. Okay. Here we go. <clears throat> yeah, it's like all hands on deck trying to fix everything. <laughs> we'll have to figure out how this happens so it doesn't happen again. Okay, there we are. Yay. All right. Here we see uh, Yeshua on the Mount of Olives looking at the temple. And how many of you are familiar with when I say Matthew 24 know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. This is Matthew 24 right here. Mm -hmm. Let's start with verse 3. It talks about how while he was seated on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and they said, please make this clear to us. When will all these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? Okay, so here he is on the Mount of Olives. They're wanting to know about the last days. And look what he says in verse 6 through 8. You're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not alarmed, for this must take place. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There's going to be famines and earthquakes, and all these are but the beginning of the birth pains. First off, I don't know what it is in some of the other languages here, but the word nation will rise against nation is not a correct English translation. The correct translation is Ethnic group will rise against ethnic group. And then kingdom against kingdom or nation against nation. Right. Now, I want you to put your yarmulkes on. And you're back 2,000 years ago sitting on the Mount of Olives. And Yeshua says to you, there's going to be wars. What wars are going to come to your mind as a Jewish person 2,000 years ago sitting on the Mount of Olives? What are you, what's going to, what are you going to be thinking of? Rome. Rome? Well, that war hasn't happened yet till 70 A.D. We're talking around 30 A.D. here. So when you hear war, what war are you going to think of? Hanukkah. Hanukkah. Exactly. Uh, Hanukkah was... Um, come on, slides. Oh, just a second. I see what happened here. Okay, just a second. Let me fix this. Uh, there. See if I can get this to work. There, Hanukkah. Hanukkah happened in 168 BC, basically, in the month of Kislev, which is roughly our December. On Kislev 25, that was the most current war in their mind. So when they think of war, they're going to think, oh my goodness, Hanukkah is going to happen again. What other war are they thinking of? How about Nebuchadnezzar destroying the temple in 586, 587 BC, the 9th of Av, which is roughly July 9th or August 9th at that time frame. Okay, so if you're hearing of wars and rumors of wars, and you're sitting at the Mount of Olives at that day, the two major wars are going to be Hanukkah and the temple being destroyed. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so what is that telling us prophetically in our day? 
Okay, the trigger is going to be a war that has to do with Hanukkah and the destruction of the temple. Now, when we think in our mind, what is the a major war that happened in the last couple centuries? How about World War I? World War I started on August 1st, 1914. Guess what? On the biblical calendar, that was the ninth of Av. So any prophetic person is going to go, wow, World War I started on the ninth of Av. He was talking about wars that are similar to the ninth of Av. We also know it'll be as in the days of Noah, correct? All right, well, guess what? I don't know how many of you have heard of the Balfour Declaration, but during World War I, on November 2nd, 1917, Lord Balfour declared there needs to be a land set aside for the nation of Israel. Well, guess what? That happened, as you can see on this, November 2nd, 1917. Guess what? November 2nd, 1917, on the biblical calendar, is Heshvan 17. Does that ring a bell for anybody? Heshvan 17 is the very day Noah's flood rains began. So here we have the ninth of Ab. We have the connection to Noah's flood rains. What about the connection to Hanukkah? World War I on December 11th, 1917 is when General Allenby conquered Jerusalem and took it over by the, with the Allied forces. Guess what? That was during Hanukkah. Okay, so we know that World War I, prophetically, was a very significant event when it comes to Matthew 24, wars and rumors of war. I believe that was the real starting point. But let's go back to an original starting point. Here we are. Let's go back 6,000 years to the Garden of Eden. <clears throat> That's the starting point. We know that God had ordained basically 6,000 years for mankind, and then on the seventh day or the millennial reign, he would rest. Does everyone understand that concept? Yes. How many of you know about 6,000 years have gone by? Yes. So that means we're really close, right? Yes. We can even look closer. What about something that happened 2,000 years ago when Messiah died? Okay, so that means we've got about 2,000 years from Messiah left to the end of the 6,000 years. Well, guess what? Let's look at something that happened 120 years ago. That was Theodore Herzl with the First Zionist Congress. This is what happened, and he decided that there needed to be a place for the Jewish people. His wasn't religiously motivated, it was more politically motivated, but it was, a, I, don't, I don't know how many of you knew this, Theodore Herzl wanted to hold the first Zionist Congress in Germany. And this is like in 1897. But guess what? The German Jew says, no, we're Germans first and then we're Jews. That's why it ended up getting held in Basel, Switzerland. But look what happened to that generation. Okay, well, let's go to a hundred years. If you go to the hundred years, you have World War I. Very significant event, as I said. Well, what about 70 years ago? You have the nation of Israel born in a day. That was very prophetic. Okay, well, what about uh, 50 years ago? Well, that's when they recaptured Jerusalem. Can you see how our time frame is narrowing down? As a matter of fact, this isn't on my notes, but... Uh, Psalms 102 verses 15 through 18 is highly significant because, listen, I'll just quote it to you. It basically says this, when the Lord will build up Zion, that's when he will appear in his glory. Well, guess what? Zion is Jerusalem. He began to build up Jerusalem in 1967. And what is the whole political problem right now today is the fact of the settlements in Jerusalem and around Jerusalem. Guess what the very next verse says? And this is being written for the generation to come. Well, guess what? In Hebrew, it's acharon, which means the terminal generation is the ones that will experience Zion being built up. 
We are that terminal generation, and guess what? It's been over 50 years since it's been being built up. So we are at the end of the end of the end. So now, when we look at Daniel's 70 weeks, we only got one week or seven years left. When does that begin? All right. Well, here's a couple of things uh, that I want to show you. Listen to Psalms 90 verse 4 on your notes. Remember there it says a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past and as a watch in the night. So if a thousand years is as a day, the six thousand years were ready to enter that seventh day. Okay, now let's look at this. <clears throat> when the AM, I have year AM, and what AM means is Anno Mundi which means the year since creation. I'm not going to be talking about A.D., B.C. I'm just going to talk about if you start with Adam and you add up the begets and how many years, this is what you come up with. And I want to point this out. Let me start in the middle, the second number down. You see the 3360 AM? That was a Shemitah year. How do we know it's divisible by seven? But it wasn't a jubilee year because it's not divisible by 49. The very next year, 3361, would be the first year of a new Shemitah cycle. That's when the temple was destroyed. So Solomon's temple from creation was destroyed in 3361 from Adam. But it was not destroyed in the jubilee year. It was sandwiched between jubilee years. And I'll tell you when that was. In the year 3333 at the top, that was a jubilee year. You put down your mic. Okay. Your mic is on. Yay! And we're also broadcasting. And we're broadcasting. Yay! Okay, good. The problem with the hand mic is I talk like this. <laughs> Doesn't get recorded. Okay, so this is on. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so the point I'm trying to make here is the temple is destroyed, but there's a jubilee before it and a jubilee after it. It so happens the year 3333 was the jubilee year, but it was the 68th jubilee, okay? Just do the math, you'll see it. Now, what do we see? About 21 years, or three speed of cycles after the temple was destroyed, was the next jubilee year, 3382, that became the 69th jubilee. Is everybody following? Yeah. Okay. Well, now, look at this. Here we are today in the year 5782, and we know it's a Shemitah year. It's divisible by seven. But we also know next year is the Jubilee because it's divisible by 49. Mm -hmm. Therefore, next year so happens to be the 118th Jubilee from creation. Wow. You say, wow, now, wait till my next slide. <laughs> Here we go. I want, does everyone, I want to go slow. I want everyone to follow this. The way you know if it's a Shemitah year is if the Hebrew year is divisible by seven. The way you know if the following year is a Jubilee year is if that Shemitah year is also divisible by 49. See how easy that is and you don't have to get confused? Okay, so this year is the 118th Jubilee. The 69th Jubilee after the temple was destroyed was 3382, which means it's the 49th Jubilee. And this September, we will begin and enter the Jubilee of Jubilees or the 50th Jubilee from the destruction of the temple. This September is critical to be the 50th Jubilee from the destruction of the temple, this is huge. Okay, so now, 
let's look at this slide here. The big question is, when will Jacob's trouble begin? Right? That last week of Daniel, the last seven years. L listen to Matthew 24. We're going to go back to that, verse 12 and 13. It says, because lawlessness will be increased. How many of you think lawlessness has increased? The love of many will wax cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom is to be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all ethnic groups, and then the end will come. Okay, so lawlessness is increasing. We know it's as the days of Noah. So let's look at Genesis 6, 11 through 13. Oh, I'm going to have verse 16 on your notes. Look at what it says. The earth was what? Is it corrupt today? Yes. In God's sight. And the earth was filled with what? Violence. And God saw the earth and behold, it was corrupt. All flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I determined to make an end of all flesh for the earth is filled with violence. Behold, I'll destroy them with the earth. Okay. So let's look at this slide here. Here we see the problem was violence. And God, he said this to Noah, right? And we know from Luke 17, 26, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will also be in the days of the Son of Man. We know that it was a time of violence evil, it was corrupt, and we know the people were clueless and they didn't get on the ark. Is that right? Yeah. And it's going to be likewise as in the days of Lot, where they ate, drank, bought, sold, planted, builded. At that time, it was everything in Noah's day, but they're also, they were morally bankrupt and they were being dishonest in the marketplace. Do we see that? Well, guess what? How many of you believe it's going to be as in the days of Noah? Yeah. Well, guess what? Noah knew it was coming. And is it going to be as in the days of Lot? Guess what? Abraham knew it was coming. We're not to be clueless. We're supposed to know the times and the seasons. Okay. So, let me talk Let's look at, uh, yeah, anyway, Luke 17, 26 through 30. It says, uh, on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rain from heaven destroyed them all. So it will be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Okay, are you ready? I got some statistics. If you want to take pictures, you can take pictures of the slides. But here's the thing. Do you guys believe we're filled with violence today? Yes. I'm going to give you some facts. The number of mass shootings, which mean at least three or four people killed, in the United States from 1966 to 2020, that's 54 years, there were 402 mass shootings, which the math says there were about seven to eight mass shootings every year for the last 54 years. That's the average. But it wasn't an average. It was exponential. From 66 to 75, that 10-year time frame, there were 12 mass shootings. But from 2011 to 2020, there was 160 mass shootings. So it's this giant curve. Here it went from one a year for every 10 years to one a month every 10 years. So in 2020, not too long ago, there was one mass shooting every single month. So here are the mass shootings go from one a year to one a month. Will it now jump to one mass shooting every week? Two years later, it's 2022? No, it is worse. So far, just this year, in 2022, we've had 10 to 11 mass shootings every week. Not one a week, 10 to 11 mass shootings every week this year so far. Look at this. It's only 19 weeks into the year. 
and we've already seen 198 mass shootings, and this was May 15th of this year. We've gone from one a year to one a month to 198 in just a few months. As a matter of fact, that was May 15th was that news article. What happened just two weeks later on Memorial Weekend? We had 12 mass shootings just that weekend. Just that weekend. Right there, you can see the date, May 31st, 2002. What happened the following weekend? Another 13 more mass shootings the very next weekend. That's dated June 6th. Now, this was just the other day. America's madness. We've had 309 mass shootings this year alone, which means two mass shootings every day. We've gone from one a year to one a month to two a day. Tell me the earth is not filled with violence. Why would we think that the Lord is not at the door? If he's going to destroy it in Noah's day, there's a lot more people on this planet today than there were in Noah's day. We have to understand the times and the seasons were there. Now, do you guys remember Joseph's dream? Seven years of plenty, and then seven years of famine. Okay? Let's look at your notes. Genesis 41, verse 53 through 57. The seven years of plenty occurred in the land of Egypt came to an end. The seven years of famine began to come, as Joseph had said. There was famine in all lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread... And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said to the Egyptians, go to Joseph, whatever he tells you to do, do. So what happens? When the famine spread over the land, Joseph opened the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe in the land. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain because the famine was severe over all the earth. Guess what? What's happening right now, people are trying to control the bread and cause a famine so everyone has to come to them. And your land is going to be sold to them. You're going to want to sell everything to them just so you can eat. This is a matter of control. Okay, let me give you an example. The last seven years before the last couple, look at this. 2017 and 2018... We had the return of economic growth, a roaring stock market. Things were great. As a matter of fact, look at this. This is 2019, basking in the booming economy. The economy continues to be turbocharged. During that Trump administration, every, the economy was flat out booming. Like, what in the world? And then what happened? Now we have empty shelves. The U.S. looks like a developing country, and that's 2021, that's last year. Many of you may have taken pictures. You thought maybe we were like it was in Russia or something. What's going on here? Parents struggle to find baby formula. What are you going to do if you can't find baby formula? We see the storm coming. The U.S. struggles to contain a deepening global food crisis. The U.K. is sleepwalking into a food crisis. Do you see the economy was great and now we're going into the time of famine. A new global food crisis is building, the World Bank warns. The world is on the brink of a food shortage. Here's what the U.S. government and businesses can do to help. Here we go. Why food shortages might drag on for years. Rubio, Lewis, call on Biden administration to allow farming on conserved land to help the global food shortages. Russia-Ukraine war could worsen African food shortages. Pick out look. Lean hog futures in the seat price downdraft China's COVID policies risk uh, crisis and food shortages. What the U.S. should do now to minimize global food shortages. Prepare for food shortages. How many get an idea there's going to be food shortages? Yeah. 
That is not me. That this is not conspiracy thinking. These are all legitimate websites that are talking about this. Syria is gearing up for a large-scale food shortage. Hard bread winter wheat towards bread shortage in 2023. Eight items you might not be able to find in the next few months here in your supermarket. Global food crisis tests Western resolve to retain Russian sanctions. But here's the problem. If you're going to grow food, you got to have fertilizer. Well, what do we see? Soaring fertilizer prices put global food security at risk. Now there's, they don't have any fertilizer. Without fertilizer, how do you grow food? Well, how many of you have been following all this news? Okay, some of you haven't. Well, guess what? The question has come, the food crisis, is it accidental or is it orchestrated? Let's take a look. Look at this. In Illinois, in January 15th of 21, Delhi Star deals with the aftermath of a devastating fire. In Alabama, a couple months later, the Tyson poultry meat plant suffered a total loss in a large fire. Pennsylvania, the departments fight fire at the main right steak meat processing plant. Winston-Salem, January 31st, thousands flee homes near the Winston-Salem fertilizer plant. They're burning the fertilizing plants down. Uh, February 22nd, Wisconsin's river meets a total loss in an overnight fire, total loss. Indiana. Uh, another place, uh, the largest U.S. soy processing plant had a fire. In February 22, seven injured at a fire in Gulf Shears food plant. Nebraska, March, another uh, Dutch creamery cheese baking facility is gutted by fire. Oh, and that goes on. In March, here at Sunnyside, Washington, a fertilizer plant fire forces evacuation. And in, uh, Indiana, an on-site investigation into a Walmart facility fire. Arkansas, Nestle Hot Pockets were shuttered by fire. In May of 22, March, crews reported to fire at the Belfast Potato Pressing Plant, Processing Plant. That's all this year that is happening here. Uh, Arizona, 50,000 pounds of food destroyed after a fire ripped through the Maricopa Food Pantry. San Juan, Texas, in March of 22, an onion warehouse was damaged. New Hampshire, April 22, there's a East Conway beef and pork was fire. Idaho, a plane crashes into an Idaho plant. That was probably more than likely accidental. Uh, but here, Taylor Farms, total loss after a large fire. Fire destroys uh, headquarters of another place. Kansas, fertilizer plant fire. I mean, it goes on and on and on. This is not normal. The no. statistics say this looks like this is being an orchestrated yeah. thing. At the bottom it says, most of these are not paltry fires, but catastrophic infernos with flames visible from even satellites, and which often require thousands of nearby residents to evacuate. The losses are not being measured in the millions, but billions of dollars, and they all put more of America's food supply under strain. Someone is trying to put the food supply under strain. How many of you have heard of Henry Kissinger? He's still alive, believe it or not. Guess what he said? Control the oil and you control the nations. Control food and you control the people. U.S. strategy deliberately destroyed family farming in the United States and abroad and led to 95% of all grain reserves in the world being under the control of six multinational agribusiness corporations. So, let's go back to the Shemitah cycle and look at when the Shemitah years are. Now, in case you didn't know, Joseph was raised out of the pit and given the kingdom on Rosh Hashanah, on the Feast of Trumpets, the, the first year of the calendar. But here we go. Now, I want you to see these four blood moons that I talked about that happened right after Israel became a nation. God said in Genesis 1.14, he created the sun and the moon for signs. And here we have that happen right as Israel becomes a nation. Then what happens? 
We had them again back in 1966 and 1967, and I believe that was a seven-year warning before the year of Jubilee, which was in 1973, and you had the Yom Kippur War. And you could only proclaim the year of Jubilee on Yom Kippur. So we see, because 70, uh, the year 5733 is divisible by 49, we know the Yom Kippur War happened in the year of Jubilee, and I believe that was a seven-year warning before the Yom Kippur War. Okay, so here we are now, and guess what? We had these four blood moons and eclipses again in 2014, 2015, and I believe that was a seven-year warning before this year of Jubilee that we are about to enter right now. And if the tribulation is seven years, how many of you know Daniel was Jewish? Yeah. Okay. Therefore, it can't be any random seven years that starts any time. It has to be the first year of a speed of cycle. So if the tribulation does not begin this coming September, it can't begin for another seven years. Does that make sense? Okay, when you understand the times and the seasons. But that tells us we really need to be watching this fall. Yeah. We're going to have a huge Rosh Hashanah service at Casey Treat's place. Okay, for Rosh Hashanah. I'm expecting well over a thousand people. Uh, because this is one feast of trumpets you do not want to miss. Okay, so. Yom Kippur coming up 2022. All right, now. This is from, if you'll notice in the top right, the World Economic Forum. Now, here's the thing. I believe a lot of this famine coming is pre-planned and organized, which is why they're burning all these things down. Now, guess what? The World Economic Forum had eight predictions for the world seven years from now. Get ready. You will own nothing and you'll be happy. You'll own nothing and you will be happy. Okay, yeah. This is socialism, communism. You'll own nothing and you'll be happy. Not only that, guess what? You'll eat much less meat. It'll be an occasional treat, not a staple. It's for the good of the environment and our health. All about climate change. So guess what? You get to eat. They say you get to eat bugs. Oh, no. Listen to what is being pushed. Why I prefer eating grasshoppers to beef. <laughs> They're already pushing this. For most people in Europe and the U.S., the, the idea of eating crickets and grasshoppers can seem revolting, but they are a popular snack in parts of Africa and Asia. Not only are they packed with nutrients, they're less harmful to the climate and the environment. <clears throat> How many of you want to just do it for the cause? Oh, this is being promoted bug time, or big time. <laughs> celebrities who eat bugs. There's all these celebrities who are pushing eating bugs. One, uh, this has been going for a while. Mark Cuban, Shark Tank. What? Yeah. In a 2014 episode, he invested $50,000 for a 10% stake in a company creating energy bars and other tasty food products from cricket protein. Oh, hey, how about Nicole Kidman? She performed for a secret talent theater, and she described the taste of insects, or micro livestock, as she called them as fruity and like nothing you've ever tasted. And during the two-minute video clip, she eats hornworms, mealworms, crickets, grasshoppers, and she says two billion people in the world eat bugs, and I'm one of them. How many of you want to join her? Oh, here we go. Here's this other lady. 
She's an award-winning scientist correspondent. She's an actor. She talks with scientists on her podcast to highlight what they're passionate about. And during a 2018 podcast, she interviews this one doctor who is an expert on eating bugs. We talk about grasshopper tacos. Who wants a grasshopper taco? Ant omelets. The nature of life. Humane bug slaughter. We got to be nice to the bugs when we slaughter them. We have to have humane <laughs> bug slaughter. Water converse conservation. Deep fried scorpions. At home, mealworm farming. Cricket chips. Protein needs and the cultural biases that are literally killing us because we don't want to do it. How many want to get into mealworm farming? Supply your neighbors. Well, get a load of this. A Swedish scientist suggested the climate crisis could lead people to consider eating human flesh. It's not the first time a scientist has suggested the idea, cannibalism. But it's all for the climate. Let's listen to Romans 1, 18 through 23. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and the unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Fake news. For what can be known about God is plain because God's shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. They became futile in their thinking. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and now creepy crawlers. And this is what's happening. We're, we're giving personal attributes to elephants, to crickets. We want to treat them humanely when we kill the cricket. We've, we've lost the glory of God, and we've brought ourselves down to the level of crickets. Of course, if you believe you came from a cricket. Uh, anyway, so going back to the good years to the bad years, the Dow suffers its longest losing streak since 2001 as stock benchmarks extend weekly losses despite closely sharp, closing sharply higher Friday. So May 14th, the stock market is crashing. And here again, uh, someone raises alarm on potential food shortages in this year. The, how about that? If you don't have food, well, as long as we have power. Well, guess what? Now they're talking about power grid shortages in Texas and several places. They don't have any power. Now what are you going to do? Okay. Here. Electricity shortage warnings grow across the United States. Prospect of power grid shortages. Okay. Your power is going to go out. What in the world are you going to do? If your power goes out, people are going to get sick. Right? And they're going to want to go to the emergency room, right? Well, guess what? Emergency centers are facing large shortages of employees even answering the 911 call. You go to call 911, you may be put on hold for 20 minutes. There's a dire shortage of nurses. Okay, well, what are you going to do? 911, who's going to come? And when you get there, there's nobody there to take care of you. Staff shortages in peril. The police are stretched thin. The army recruiting crisis. There's a shortage of soldiers. Well, hey, we got the fire department. No, you don't. The fire departments are battling staffing shortages amid low number of new recruits. I mean, there's everything is cascading down. Every, as a matter of fact, what are you going to do if you need insulin? What are you going to do if you need drugs? Guess what? The current drug shortage bulletins. There are pages and pages. I think at the bottom. 224 different drugs that are short on. Hopefully it's not one that you're going to need. 
But here, we have, again, the World Economic Forum. And they say the Great Reset. How many of you heard of the Great Reset? Okay, yeah. if you haven't, look into it. The Great Reset, they're trying to reset the economies of the world. And it starts with farms. It starts with farms. Well, guess what? Bill Gates just purchased oh. a bunch yeah. of farms. Farm. He oh, owns, man. he's already amassed 270,000 acres of farmland. Bill Gates knows the whole thing is about the food, just yeah. like Joseph did. And what they're doing, they're buying hundreds of the elite, the deep state, whatever. Yeah. Farmland across the United States is being all consolidated into few people so they can control you. Yeah. And when you want food, you're going to sell your house, you're going to sell your land, you're going to sell everything, and you'll become a slave to the government, and you'll be happy because you'll own nothing. Happy times are here again. Okay. Let me explain the biblical principle, the evil biblical principle that's happening. Let's go back to the story of Joseph. Look at Genesis 47, verse 13 through 25. This is long. But I want you to hear what I'm really saying that the Spirit talked to you about. This is what the deep state is doing. There was no food in all the land. The famine was very severe, so the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished by reason of the famine. So get Joseph gathered up all of your money that was found in the land of Egypt in the land of Canaan in exchange for the grain. They got grain, he gets all the money. And believe me, it'll be high, exorbitant prices for the grain. And Joseph brought the money to Pharaoh's house, and when the money was all spent in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, now all the Egyptians come to Joseph and say, give us food, why should we die? Before your eyes, our money is all gone. That's what's coming to a bank near you. And Joseph answered, well, give me your livestock, and I will give you food in exchange for your livestock if your money's gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them food in exchange for their horses, flocks, herds, and donkeys. He supplied them with food in exchange for all their livestock that year. And when that year was ended, they came to him the following year and said, We will not hide from my Lord that our money is all spent. The herds of livestock are yours. There's nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our land. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? So he said, Great. They said, Buy us and our land for food, and we with our land will be servants to Pharaoh and give us seed that we may live and not die and that the land may not be desolate. So what does the government do? The government gets, buys you, buys your land just so you can have food. And so it says, Joseph bought all the lands of Egypt for Pharaoh for all the Egyptians sold their fields because the famine was severe. The land became Pharaoh's. As for the people, he made them servants from one end of Egypt to the other. Only the land of the priests he did not buy. The priests had a fixed allowance. Yeah, we'll give you a set monthly allowance, you know, just so you'll be happy. We'll give everyone $1,000 a month, and, and you'll be happy. And Joseph said to the people, Behold, uh, I have this day bought you and your land for Pharaoh. Now here is seed. Sow the land, but it's not your land. It's Pharaoh's land. And the harvest you'll have to give a fifth to Pharaoh and four-fifths will be yours. Uh, and they said, You saved our lives. May it please my Lord. We will be servants. And that's what is coming to a planet near you very, very, very soon. We see everything crashing down. Okay, now, I don't think these next two verses are on your notes, but I added them. Revelation eleven eighteen. The nations are raging, but your wrath is come, and the time for the dead to be judged, and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, the saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying, you're going to destroy God, the destroyers of the earth. There are people, Satan does not like humans. He doesn't want God when he comes to reign over anybody. So he's out to depopulize, which is why there's going to be big wars coming. The whole purpose is we want need fewer people that will, we can control. Okay? Too many people, we can't control them all. So they want to depopulate the earth through wars. That's why big wars are coming. 
But man wants to destroy, or Satan through man wants to destroy the earth. The good news is, God said, no, that's my job. Man wanted to destroy the earth in Noah's day through violence, and God said, no, that's my job. I don't believe God is going to allow man to destroy this earth. That's the good news. That doesn't mean man's not going to try. God says the first time was the flood, the second time is by fire. He's already predetermined how and when the earth will be destroyed. Mankind cannot do it. They're sure going to try. But listen to this. Matthew 24, 22. How many of you have ever heard of this? And except those days have been shortened, no flesh would have been saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. You know what? I believe those days could signify also this is the year 5782. We're supposed to have 6,000. God is saying, I've allowed it 6,000 years, but if I don't cut those days short, man will have destroyed the earth, and they definitely have the capability now. So I believe that could be the days that have been shortened. Okay, so now there is such a, th- how many of you know about data they want to get your data, everything that you do, traffic on the, well, all the traffic, everything about you, where you drive, how you drive. Well, guess what? That is physical information. More than anything, they want biological information, which is why they have Fitbits that measures your heart rate, your temperature, how you're doing. There's about to come a merger between all the biological information about you with all the technical information about you, and they will know by your heart rate when you see something, what is happening uh, in your mind. They're gonna know you better than you know you. So I want you to watch this two minute video. Go ahead, Jill. We can hack humans. This is the guy in charge of the Great Reset. You'll have to turn the volume up. We don't have any volume. What? Oh, we have to have volume. Yeah, we'll have to have volume. We'll just wait to see if we can't get volume somehow. See if we can start it over. So I think maybe in a couple of decades when people look back, the thing they will remember from the COVID crisis. Okay, here we go. We're starting over. Some of them hastened by COVID, by vaccine passports, by government apps, by surveillance. Here's a lot of say. Yeah, that was COVID's role. Science is not really a why we use it earlier. Science is not really about truth. It's Science about is not about truth, he said. So I think maybe in a couple of decades when people look back, the thing they will remember from the COVID crisis is this is the moment when everything went digital. And if, if this, is, this was the moment when every, everything became monitored. Monitored. That we agreed to be surveyed. We agreed to be time. surveilled. Not just in authoritarian measures, but even in democracies. Even in democracies. And maybe most importantly of all, this was the moment when surveillance started going under the skin. Because really, we haven't seen anything yet. Right? I think that the big process that's happening right now in the world is uh, hacking human beings, the ability to hack humans, to understand deeply what's happening within you, what, what makes you what makes you go? And for that, the most important data is not what you read and who you meet and what you buy, it's what's happening inside your body. So we had these two big revolutions, the computer science revolution, or the infotech revolution, and the revolution in the biological sciences. And they are still separate, but they are about to merge. They are merging around, I would say, the biometric sensor. It's the thing, it's the gadget, the technology that converts biological data into digital data that can be analyzed by computers. And having the ability to really monitor people under the skin, this is the, the biggest game changer of all. <laughs> okay. That is coming now. Now, there's not that. Take a look. They now have robots that can be monitored far away that has machine guns on it. Go ahead. We're not seeing, there it is.
can be a rifle. It can, uh, that's good. Jill, that's good. This uh, is made by China, but it's a Russian machine. Okay, I just want you to see the book of Revelations. We are so there. I believe there is a major war coming, but it's going to be between the globalists. The globalists from the east, China, versus the globalists from the west, America, Europe, who are all battling to see who's the one. They know once this, whoever manages the data and controls the, pe is, controls the food is going to be the one to control the people. That's why you see this big division with China and Russia over Ukraine and what's going on with Europe. A lot of it has a deeper meaning of the globalists competing. <clears throat> now here I'm just going to read this. You'll have to just listen, and I'm sorry for the translators. I don't, the translators didn't get this in advance, this part, I don't think. So I'll go slow. China is now the world's leading seller of AI-powered yeah. surveillance equipment. Yeah. They, it's, it's a war going on. They want to be the number one sellers of all AI equipment. In Malaysia, the government is working with a Chinese AI company to bring facial recognition technology to their police state. China, Chinese companies have also bidded to outfit every one of Singapore's 110,000 lampposts with facial recognition cameras. Okay. See, China wants to control all the nations, so they're getting bids from all the nations so that the authoritarian regime can stay in power. But they'll be submitted to China. In South Asia, the Chinese government supplied surveillance equipment to Sri Lanka. Let's see. They've also outfitted Mongolia's capital with surveillance cameras. Farther west in Serbia, they've also helped set up a safe city system complete with facial recognition cameras and so joint patrols conducted by the Serbians and the Chinese police and it's aimed at helping Chinese tourists to feel safe. Today in Kenya, Uganda, uh, Mauritius, they're outfitting major cities with Chinese-made surveillance networks. The Chinese telecom Titan sold Ethiopia a wireless network with built-in backdoor access for the government. In a later crackdown, the dissidents were rounded up for brutal interrogations during which they were played audio from recent phone calls they had made and they didn't know it was recorded. In Egypt, Chinese developers are looking to finance the construction of a new capital. It's slated to run on a smart city platform. In Southern Africa, Zambia has agreed to buy more than $1 billion in telecom equipment from China, including internet monitoring technology. China will, with the world's largest manufacturer of AI-enabled surveillance cameras, even has an office in Johannesburg, South Africa. In 2018, China inked a deal with the Zimbabwean government to set up a surveillance network. Having set up beachheads in Asia, in Europe, in Africa, China's AI companies are now pushing into Latin America, a region the Chinese government describes as a core economic interest. China financed Ecuador's $240 million purchase of a surveillance camera system. Bolivia as well has bought surveillance equipment with help from a loan from Beijing. Venezuela recently debuted a new national ID card system that logs citizens' political affiliations in a database built by China. Okay. We need to realize we are there. Yeah. We're there. Yeah, this Rosh Hashanah begins a new seven-year cycle. Will the tribulation begin in a few months? We're talking a couple of months. 
we have to be watching. If not, well, we got seven more years. But with this being a year of Jubilee, the land in Leviticus 25, God says the land will not be sold forever, for the land is mine. And the year of Jubilee, all the land returns to the original owner. God's the original owner. This is the year of Jubilee. Is the land going to return to him? Very interesting. Uh, and this isn't to scare anybody as much as it is to equip everybody. If, 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 you want, if you live in a hurricane area, you want to know when the hurricane's coming. You want the alarm when the tornado is coming. I am telling you, everything I told you this morning is coming like a hurricane, and we need to make sure we're prepared. And don't eat bugs. All right? Let's stand and let's pray. Sorry I went a little long, but I wanted to get this out. Avinu Mokenu, our Father, our King, wake us up. We don't want to be like frogs in the boiling water. Teach us to number our days. Father, I just pray right now you give all of us seeing eyes, hearing ears, hearts to understand what you're speaking to us at this time. Lord, wake us up. The church isn't just asleep, it's in a coma. God, wake us up. Speak to us so we know how and what to speak and when to speak to others, Father, who we love. Let all of us be as watchmen and be accountable for warning others of the time to come. We don't want anyone's blood on our hands. So, Father, I just pray that you would turn everyone here and everyone that's watching uh, into a mouthpiece. Father, to magnify your Torah and to make it honorable once again. Thank you for giving us eyes to see in Yeshua's name. And as the Lord told Moses to tell Aaron to bless his children, and by not only blessing them, he would put his name on them. And he told them to say, Varekaka Adonai Vaish Maraka, Ya'er Adonai Panadileka Vihuneka, Yisa Adonai Panadileka, Vyasem Baka Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In that most wonderful name, Eye Asher, Eye. Amen. Amen. Be blessed. <laughs>